and gentlemen, welcome back to the Art of Move podcast with William Raybar and myself, Anthony Manuel. On our last episode, we kind of dove into foundations of what we functional fitness kind of means. We sort of moved the focus away from growing muscles and and having mus pure muscular strength and output into a more integrated approach of respecting joint function and moving away from training muscles into the idea of training patterns which respect natural human biomechanics. And the, the questions that kind of came up from that last episode were, what are the foundational patterns that sort of make up what uh, the way a, a human body should move functionally within space and through manipulating objects? So what are the actual foundations of functional movement? If the goal of functional fitness is to train patterns which are functional, well, what are those patterns? And that's kind of what Will and I are hoping to ex explore today. One of the other foundations that we sort of established was that everything functional sort of starts from the foot, from the ground up. And so what I'd like to do with Will is I'd like to kind of get a broad overview of if you were going to start approaching training patterns in a functional way, what are the what are the basics? If the if the old school way of thinking are the basics are a squat, push, pull, hinge, lunge, uh, then what are the foundations of functional movements? Can we break them down into simple terms like that? And how can we approach this? So Will, what after that, what do you think just off the get go, starting from the ground up, should we take this by a joint by joint approach or should we forego that that isolated thinking and should we go right into patterns? Um, yeah, traditionally it's been joint by joint pretty much. Okay. Um, looking at each joint, so, you know, feet, ankles, knees, hips, uh, lower back, mid back, shoulders, and then parsing it out like that. Right. So understanding the body in an isolated way. When I went to school in both university and, and Cairo school, and I think it still goes this way that, um, if you have an injury, you look above and below the joint to see what is wrong. You don't look at the area of injury unless it's a direct blow. Okay. So that's a, about as far as they lead you. They're like, something is wrong abo above or below. We don't know how to parse it out more than that. Okay. So in that sense, the joint by joint approach is what worked. But now we can be like, okay, instead of looking at um, the injury directly, forget about injuries for a second. What is the best way to move about? I would say if I'm landing, that's a way to parse it out. So what does every human being look like when they land to earth period? Okay. So I, from there, I would say my head has to be over my foot. Some people would say head over foot. Some people would say building a column. Basically head is in line with the foot. Um, your hip is back, so your back chain dominant. Uh, rib cage in front of your hip, okay? Your side bent a little bit to one side so that your spine can move from side to side. That's a spinal engine, okay? And your leg will have a certain shape. It's a bow out, ideally, because your ankle and your hip are in one line, and they're working together, okay? That right there is how I would build the foundation for a functional movement. Your landing pattern has to look like this versus right. uh, joint by joint. When you're saying landing pattern, there, there's a few things. I'm gonna, I'm gonna basically echo back a few things that I said and see if I can get some more clarity for people who are listening. Sure. Um, yeah, the old model that you're, you, you know, the, the old model that you're working on basically, it's funny because I knew exactly what you were talking about. When you have an injury, you kind of look above and below the joint that feels injured to see, you know, is there something pulling or like the, the, the example that came to my mind was like when you have a sore lower back, people are like, well, how tight are your hamstrings, right? Or how tight are your hip flexors? Because they're like, okay, well, maybe this joint's pulling on you or maybe you, you know, they, they won't think about the, the movement pattern causing dysfunction necessarily, right? So they, they have this, that's the old way of thinking where you're looking at the joint, you're looking at the surrounding area about how the surrounding area might affect the joint, but you're not actually looking at the, the, the quality of movement. When you said the term landing, I'm gonna assume that you mean landing your foot in a gate, right? So if you're walking or running, that's your that's your landing. You're not landing, you know, 
out of the womb onto the floor when you're born. You're not landing, uh, you know, from a jump or anything. This is this is like we're talking like fundamental 101. You're taking a step forward. How are you taking that step forward? How is your foot striking the ground? What kind of columns or weight distribution do you have from side to side as you're stepping? These are the uh, if you're talking about functional fitness. We're training patterns to, would you say, maximize the efficiency of the human gait of being able to walk and run? I would say that's fundamental, absolutely. Um, walking and running is what we do the most, of course, walking for most people. Um, but no matter what, you're taking 10,000 steps a day. Even an office worker does that for the most part. Okay, <laughs> so like um, handstands, they're, they're fine, but how often are you doing them? There's many things that we're doing, repetitive squatting, uh, squatting other than a resting position, you know, we're never really doing these things, okay? So running, walking, this is what we're doing all the time. So looking towards perfecting those mechanics is where we should be going, in my opinion. And right. the best way to do that is slow motion. So what I'm getting here is how I'm looking at, or what I'm telling you is how I look at slow motion. The reason I'm saying the body has to look a certain way when you're landing to, to earth, your foot landing means that I've looked at it in slow motion hundreds or thousands of times. And this seems like the best way to do it amongst right. the people who are either athletic or old and can move really well or um, young and can move really well. Basically, everyone that moves really, really well has certain characteristics that you can go frame by frame on in slow motion. Right. So... I want to I want to break down because you you went right into the the mechanics of proper gait right out of the gate. <laughs> yeah, and, right out of the and, go. And, and I want to I want to break it down a little bit more. You brought up columns. You brought up the term back chain dominant. Um, you brought up the bowing of the leg. And I want to break down what each of those mean and why they're fundamental to movement. Why they're important, you know. And and like I yeah. said, we're gonna start from the ground up. We're gonna avoid at first. I still want to go joint by joint to understand what the function of each joint is because say the function of the shoulder joint, for example, would be to throw because human beings evolved to throw so that we were more effective hunter gatherers, but we're training them to press hundreds of pounds over our head. Well, is that causing a dysfunction in the shoulder, right? So I want to, I want to talk about each joint and the sort of way we should approach training it from a movement perspective, but let's start with since we have the most fundamental thing is our gait, let's start from the foot. If you're extending your foot, where should you be landing on that front foot that's taking a step forward? Where is your foot landing? And how should you be thinking about moving that foot? So I look at the foot, like pretend this is the pinky toe and this is the um, big toe here. I wanna land somewhere around the fourth and fifth metatarsal and roll in. But as I'm rolling, I'm also pivoting a little bit like this, okay? I imagine a little bit of a boomerang on my foot like that because that's what it feels like when I hit it correctly. And when I do that, I can get a good pattern going, okay? So fourth and fifth metatarsal rolling in towards the big toe, but never really touching down unless you need balance. Right, so, so it's kind of outside edge of the foot, kind of a half dome, sort of pattern rotating in and spiraling in towards the big toe. So you start on the outside edge and you rotate in towards the big toe without letting the inside collapse is what I'm hearing. Cause you don't want to actually push down into your big toe. Yeah. I don't want to push down and collapse the arch of my foot at all. I may use mm -hmm. the big toe if I need balance or something like that, but for the most part, it's just there for, um, for balance if I need it. Okay, for mm -hmm. the most part, I'm sticking off of it. But the thing is, uh, the concepts here don't mesh. Okay, so the concept I'm working off of is a pivot point system. The traditional concept is a straight line system. So the right. straight line system won't understand the pivot system. So let me unpack that a little bit here. Okay, when your the traditional model, the straight line model says that you're using something called the windlass mechanism. Your big toe has to come off, okay? Right. It must come off in order to stretch and strengthen the fascia underneath your foot. And that's what gives the foot its rigidity. 
and kind of like a trampoline that's bouncing up and down. Now, I disagree with that. I actually think that um, the bones of the outside of the foot, it's a bony area. The inside of your foot, the dome, is a soft tissue area. So you're supposed right. to stick on the bones for the most part on the outside edge of the foot. And that's actually what gives the structure of, to your foot. Kind of like the palm of your hand. You can feel bone and in the middle, it's soft tissue. But I want to push from the outside edge of my hand versus the inside edge of my hand because it's stronger on the outside edge. So you're saying it, it basically has, the old model is we have this soft tissue that's sort of stretched out and it has like a trampoline-like elasticity. And that would be like that, that like harder part of the soft tissue of the inside of your foot. The, the old model is... Yeah, so the the old model is your plantar fascia has to have some sort of elasticity, but you're saying that the the actual point of structural support in your foot is that bony outer edge, and it makes more sense to plant your foot, you know. And again, you're saying the old model is heel to toe, and you're kind of you're counting on that plantar fascia to have that springiness, that elasticity, right? Exactly. Versus versus now you're saying no step on the outside edge of your foot and pivot where the bone structure is strongest because that's where your foot is most structurally sound if you're doing that you're protecting the the tissues in your foot yes yes and i'm also saying that the big toe isn't needed for the windless mechanism i think okay, okay. That, that'll be a controversial point if you can stretch your foot out as you're rotating it you're still going to get a tightening of the fascia in the bottom of the foot. The big toe is not needed for this. Okay, so um, that's my opinion on that. And uh, it's an interesting one for sure. Right now, in my own personal practice, I'm practicing off the fourth and fifth metatarsal and it feels way better, way more spring. And that also leads to um, landing with your foot very supinated. Okay, so... Um, Basically, when you're landing and you slow mo it or take a still pitcher, your foot mm. almost looks like it's tilted outwards. Mm. Okay, that leads to the ankle, right? Right. So I, I assume you have some questions about the ankle, or yeah, a little bit, right? So, you know, for for people who don't know what fourth and fifth metatarsal are, you could also just break it down as like pinky toe and ring toe if you're equating it to fingers, right? So those last two toes on the very outside edge of your foot. That's sort of where you're driving your weight towards. And then as you come up, you sort of boomerang it in towards the big toe. And you can even just take a step and, and feel what that's like. You're almost like making like a little dome with your foot, starting from the outside edge to the inside edge as you're stepping. Yeah, you so, never hit the toes though. No. And, unless you need balance or you messed up. And mm -hmm. uh, somebody told me this, I can't remember who it was, but they said, oh, that's what we learned in the army when we wanted to walk really quietly. So from that on, I, I kind of get people to really exaggerate it like that. Although you wouldn't be doing that in real life exaggerating it. It really is about keeping your ankle bone high, which is the next thing, right? right. But um, it gives you a feeling of what it's like to stay on the outside edge versus dumping on the inside edge. 95% yep. of people I see are dumping in on the inside. So even... Um, um... Even I, I, I took ninjutsu when I was young. When I was a kid, that was like the martial art I took. It's like how, how to be a ninja. And that's what they said. It's like start on the outside edge and let it softly come down. And that's the softest, most sound free. Like that. if you want to stay quiet and sneak up on someone as a ninja, you can go from the outside edge to the inside edge and you're, you're less likely to make a noise when you're stepping. So that's, that's ninja stepping. And, you know, I find it funny, too, because you, you often say, like, you know, my, my goal isn't to be jacked. I want to be a ninja when I'm 80, you know? <laughs> yeah, so, absolutely. Just getting better and better. <laughs> That's exactly yeah, what so I was thinking when you said ninjutsu. I'm like, I'm still doing that. <laughs> I'm not, right? It's just it's putting movement together in a real-life context, right? So um, that's the thing about martial arts. Uh, it's test and retest, and if it works, keep it, like Bruce Lee says, if it works, keep it, and disregard the rest. So in, yeah. you know, in MMA or something like that, they might disregard some traditional martial arts with good movement because it doesn't apply to fighting. But yeah. On, yeah. in the opposite end of the spectrum, you can pick up um, some really good mu movement cues and ways of moving from traditional martial arts 
because mm. they tried it millions of times over. The best way to kick is probably someone who's done it a million times, right? So right. there's something so, to be picked up from all those. Anyway, I'm off track on this. I think I think that's also why it's called the art of move, right? Like the art of move is your brand and, and, and you sort of approach it the way a, a martial artist would. You're looking at the movements that work and the patterns that work and the things that are functional and you apply them and you disregard what is useless. Essentially, it becomes uh, movement itself becomes an art that has its own quality of beauty, its own quality of aesthetic, its own quality of of virtue in itself, right? So that's kind of why that's the, that's the approach. So we we we'll, let, let's bring it back to the foot, right? Because we we have we have the foot. We we so basically when you're stepping down, you're starting on the outside edge and you roll your foot kind of onto the inside without touching your toes down unless you need balance. Which kind of let's let's kind of keep going up the column, right? So you you started mentioning the ankle. What did you want to say about the ankle? Ooh, there's a lot to say about the ankle, right? So the thought process is this: keep the or my thought process at the moment, and I'll explain how it differed from how I traditionally looked at it. Keep the ankle bone high. The inside of your ankle has to be higher than the outside of your ankle. So the bone on the inside should have, if you drew a line from one to the other, it should always be pointing up, okay? Inside ankle bone high. This is a go-to concept, by the way, okay? And that's where I got it from. But in my own personal practice, this has been the key. If you can keep that ankle bone high, you're going to keep energy in that pivot point system. If you let it drop, then the, the straight line system will apply okay you want right. to keep it rotary okay you want to keep that ankle in uh how do you say like basically you want to keep its integrity as you move about and the way to do that is to make sure your ankle bone is high at all times this right. goes against what most people are saying right now in terms of rehab physio chiropractic sports therapy they say when you land, you have to have a supination. So that bone has to come in at one point. Okay. Uh, go to, and what I'm saying now is like, no, it doesn't because it's a pivot point system. Okay. Your foot can still independently kind of flop back without having that ankle bone drop. Okay. And that flop back, I, what I mean is it's almost like, uh, you know, when you're swimming and you kind of propel your hand back. Yeah. This is what the ankle's doing when you keep that ankle bone high in a pivot point. Okay, it's kind of coming back like that. Right. Okay. So, so it, it, it helps um, propel the energy. It helps propel you forward when you keep that high. And so, so the thing I want to slow you down for a second because this is a really important point. It's very easy to, to to glaze over this. Is we're differentiating the foot between going from heel to toe in a straight line, and the new paradigm that Will just introduced is a pivot point. Right. So we're that's where that sort of boomerang shape on your foot, that outside bony edge of your foot, it pivots and rotates a little bit, and it's a rolling force transference as opposed to just pushing your foot down and squeezing your toes and extending your calf. You're, you're focusing more on the transference of force and the transference, the efficient transference of energy on the outside edge of your foot. This is a pivot not a heel to toe action, right? There's a difference in the paradigm of the mechanism that he, he's introducing here. And I didn't want people to miss that. Absolutely. And, and here's the thing. If you're a, a lay person, basically anyone who's not really into the movement game right now, your take home message is keep your ankle bones high and try to stay on the outside edge of your foot. Mm. Do that and you will have some good success. Okay. It may feel a little bit weird at first, but inside ankle bone high, outside edge, heel away, and you'll be doing really well, okay? But for the people who are really looking at this and uh, want to get into the controversy, basically, um, if you don't keep your ankle bones high and the ankle bone dumps in, I call that a leak of energy, period, mm. okay? And we, we actually knew this before. Even Kelly Starrett, somebody who's prominent in the CrossFit field would say, if an NFL athlete goes in, in his rookie year, and that ankle bone is dropping, the NFL knows that they're not going to make it more than five years. He said something along those lines, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is because they know it's associated with ACL tears. Right. Okay. So 
um, they know that connection. Physios are aware, chiropractors are aware, but the question is how high does that ankle bone need to stay? There still is a model saying that ankle bone needs to come in towards the middle mm. to supinate, okay? And it can stay high. In my, in my view, it can stay high and the foot can pivot around, okay? Right. So that right. ankle acts like a, what Goda would call a gyroscope. It moves in multiple planes, but the point is, in practicality, you want to keep that ankle bone high all yeah. the time. That includes resting postures. Right. So if you're just standing there, you don't want the arch of your foot to collapse. You don't want the inside. You can still rest maybe on your heel as long as that outside pressure on your foot is staying. And that, and again, like think not in terms of like the inside part of you. When I heard inside ankle bone high, I visualized my heel staying off the ground. Right. But it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to. Sometimes keeping your inside ankle bone high, your heel will stay off the ground, especially during a stride. On my heel doesn't strike the ground too much when I'm striding now, practicing these movement patterns. But if you're resting on your heels, you can still have that outward pressure to maintain the height of it. Just look down at your ankle bones. You can usually see your ankle bones. Are, are they collapsing inward or are they lifting up because you have a natural outward pressure? Now, the outward pressure that you have on the outside edge of your foot has some consequences in terms of the natural shape and the natural activation of different parts of your leg. So as we move up the leg, if you're, if you're pressing out, your knee and your leg, the shape of your leg is going to naturally create what you were calling the bow, right? And now, when I, and again, when I heard this, I was like, okay, well, isn't being bow-legged bad? right? Like there's, there's bow leggedness. Can you just take a second so that people aren't tripping out and like, what's, what's the difference between having a healthy bow in your stride and being bow legged? Okay. So bow legged is basically your bones are shaped that way. Okay. Right. Um, from birth, having a good bow, like, uh, Goda would say basically is being back chain dominant and sinking into your hip. So basically it shows that your glute is working and you've sunk into that hip and that you're in a good position. Your knee will naturally bow out. You can see it in uh, basically almost every good athlete. Okay, any athlete that's made it a long time, you're gonna see a good bow. It's a indication of power. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily have to do with the shape of the bones. It is the position to be in because your hips and your ankles are aligned and in the right position. Hmm. And I mean, we can, we can even pull up. What's nice is we, we have a, we have a system on no filter where we can pull up images and we can actually show what we mean by this. I want to find a good picture of a, of a good bow, but, um, sure. but, but when I'm you're gonna, saying, so, so I'm going to, I'm going to slow you down though, because you said, you said a term, sure. anytime you say a term like back chain dominant, for example, you said it's, it means that you're sinking into your hips, but there's more to that. So first of all, let's, let's start with something very fundamental. What is the front chain and the back chain and why is it better to be back chain dominant versus front chain dominant? Okay. So this one is so simple yet almost nobody does it because it's an mm. awareness piece. It's a behavior. Basically you look at your hips and your shoulders. If your shoulders are behind your hips, Imagine that you're just, you're leaning back. Okay. Then your front chain dominant, you can feel your abs working. Just lean back a lot. You'll feel your abs working to a small degree. Your abs, your hip flexors, your quads, the front chain, your body will be dominant and always tense. This is why a lot of people have the hip flexor issues, right? right. And if your hips are behind your shoulders, you have that hunched forward posture, but your spine is long at the same time. Okay, um, that's key, not just having everything hunched, but the um, spine being long at the same time. Then your back chain dominant, the back part of your body is gonna take the load. And there's a sweet spot. Everyone's is slightly different, but it only takes a little bit of lean forward. And there's a sweet spot where your muscles won't be so tense, but the structure itself will still keep you up. It's a forward gear, it's you going forward, which is happening 99.999% of the time, that is what you want to be in resting. 
uh, you want actively rest in uh, back chain dominance, but behind and below the rib cage, but behind and below the rib cage. That's key right there. Okay, whether you're standing or kneeling or sitting, that's what yeah. you want. So, you know, one of these things that you said was, you know, you're moving forward 99.9% .9 of the time. And I think the core of, if you're thinking in terms of functional fitness and how to train patterns for functional fitness is look at what you do most of the time and figure out what those movements are and then define or understand physiologically what are the most efficient elegant, appropriate ways for your body to do those movements. So when we're talking about being in a back chain dominance, because we are f like what, what uh, the GOTA system, which is the greatest of all time athletes, they take these slow motion videos of these exceptional athletes. They say back chain dominant because it propels you forward because we are forward locomotive creatures, right? We move forward in space. So our training and our posture and everything should be biased to help us move forward in space more efficiently. That's fundamental 101, what the core of functional fitness should be in my mind, right? So that's back chain dominance is you're, is you're pulling your hips slightly behind your, your rib cage. You said that behind and below. So not, 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 like, not like a Donald Duck butt or anything, right? But just, just enough so that if you're tilting your ribs up and leaning it slightly forward, you can feel that your natural tendency is to want to move forward in space, not to sit back and, and, and lean in, into, you know, sit back in your chair and just, you know, chill out, whatever it might be. Absolutely. Um, uh, that's, to me, you're decoding. You're putting in front chain dominant behavior every time you sit in that pattern. Okay, so when, uh, and I do it as well, right? I was really guilty of this um, before I realized what was happening, right? A few years ago. Yeah. So everyone's doing it to some degree. You want to have less of this behavior as possible, but below and behind rib cage, even if you're sitting, tilt forward a little bit. Um, that's basically how far that goes. Yeah, so there's neutral, go forward a little bit. Yeah, so. I would say even that's excessive, but fine, right? Yeah, this, this, is, this is dramatic, right? Like if I'm sitting back in my chair, this is front chain dominant. And again, like you, if, you're, if you're listening on Spotify, you can watch these streams on no filter on video and you can actually see if I'm, if I'm sitting back in my chair and my shoulders are behind my hips, then I am front chain dominant. I can be neutral by just sitting up backing my shoulders directly over my hips, or I could slightly lean forward. Now my shoulders are in front of my hips. This isn't uncomfortable. I'm still sitting in my chair. I'm still supported by my chair, but I can actually feel my lower back decompress a little bit in this position. And this is how I'm sitting at my work desk now, is that slight upright posture, slight lean forward so that I can feel my back chain activate. It's very, very comfortable. I don't feel any lower back tension. In fact. The opposite since I've started doing this, my lower backs felt great. Um, and, and this is just this, this notion of this is the native position. This is what our bodies physiologically want to do. So whether you're sitting in a chair listening to this or you're standing up and walking listening to this, just lift your ribs up a little bit and lean them slightly forward so that your shoulders are just slightly in front of your hips and see what a difference that makes in terms of how you feel in your body because it, it makes a difference. Yeah, and you, and you want to do it in all your activities. You'd be surprised at the amount of people I see running and jogging in a front chain dominant position. This is going to lead to pain. Okay, so eventually, if you want to stay out of pain, the easiest way is to just look at your uh, where you put the pressure of your body. Okay, this is one of those 80-20, uh, you know, you'll get a lot of fruit if you actually just do it, but it's a behavior change. You have to be aware all the time. Yeah, totally. Can we go back so, to um, uh, joint by joint? Yeah. Do you want to do you want to go back to the bow really quick, and we can kind of explain what sure. a bow is? Because I, I I pulled up uh, I pulled up a picture here. I'm gonna quickly share my screen, and we can kind of break down a bow. I have this picture here, and the reason I pulled it up, it's not a high res picture, but it is a picture that sort of it, it's good because it has the arrows that sort of indicate 
the Boeing structure. And I really like that you can see his upper body position in relation to his hips here. So when we're when we're talking about a bow, thinking about the 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 sort of stacking, do you want to break this down a little bit? You want to take a look and and, and say a little sure. bit about this photo? Sure. Um, the reason I like it, okay, is because it's what we talked about, um, and I didn't even pull this up, you did, right? So this is perfect. Um, what we talked about off the beginning, take a look at where his head is. If you look at it where his head is, it's right over the foot. He's ready to land. So this is a frame-by-frame -frame picture. He probably landed one frame before this. You can see that the leg's not straight. It's slightly bowed out. Great behavior, because you can explode off that. The bones are ready to turn in the same position. So right now he's landed on the outside edge of his foot. His femur's out, so it's externally rotated, and his tibia is relatively uh, externally rotated as well, okay? Then he's gonna pivot both of them at the same time, and uh, that will propel his hip forward, okay? That's the next move. Both the femur and the tibia spinning internally with the foot, okay? So that'll propel his head to the other side and just repeat that. That's running, okay? So having a nice bow structure is absolutely key. You want your leg bowed out, not completely straight up and down when you're landing. Now, what are the what are the downsides of having, if you were landing with your, again, this is the idea of stacking your joints and, and having like we were you, were you mentioned before it's like well you want good columns but he's bowing and he's he's releasing this energy again he's he's creating this pattern where in the first image you can see his foot coming down and then you can see his ankle is out because he's rotated he's done that pivot off of his foot so his heel rotates out as his hips are rotating creates that bow on the other side of his leg what would be the downside of say stacking your joints or being more linear or boxed in with your hips and your like what would be the downside of not setting a bow physiologically because it's not one it's not a super strong structure can you pull that back up it's not a yeah, super sure. strong structure in that a bow is literally like a bow arrow coming out you're using that it band as a, a fascial pull to spring right. you out of that um that bow position basically, right? So, right. Um, and the structure of the bones itself allows full rotation. So say you landed straight, you'd already be half rotated at the bone, mm -hmm. okay? So yeah. you'll only have half the turn of the bone and half the turn of the muscle to propel you forward. Right. Plus you're not stacking your joints actually correctly in order to have structure. The correct structure of stacking is in this photo it's out not completely straight up and down your structure okay uh, like integrity won't be there mechanically if it's straight up and down this is my right. opinion so you're saying there's more of a diagonal stack rather than like a vertical stack when you're in movement look this only makes sense in a rotary model if a yeah if a um a person looking at a linear model is going to go this person isn't running correctly he needs mm. to straighten up, keep his spine straight, brace the core, and rip forward. Um, this just wouldn't make sense, right? It only makes sense in a rotary model. His leg is bowed out because both of his bones are spinning the same way right after he lands. So when he lands, they're in one position. When he takes off, they both spin internally. Mm. And in order to have that full capacity, you need to have your head over your foot and your leg bowed out. Right. Yeah. Right. So if um, when you're when you're talking about like the internal rotation, because again, I, I remember seeing uh, before I adopted the rotary model, I would see people have their feet, you know, their heels coming out at the at the end, and I would think, oh, well, their 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 legs are internally rotated. That's going to be bad because their hips are internally rotated. Where uh, where does that internal rotation? So you're almost you're you're not necessarily externally rotating your foot when you step forward, but there is a natural bowing of the leg outwards, right? When you step, just because of the force, you're stretching your IT band. For people who don't know, you're stretching out the side, the sort of tissue on the side of your leg that's in between your hamstring and your quadricep that has 
it lengthens and then that elastic tension releases to propel you forward. And then where does that internal rotation originate from? Like what's the joint action of that internal rotation when you're coming from the front foot and you're bowing and then you're internally rotating as, as you're stepping forward with the other foot, where does that rotation initiate from? Well, it, it initiates from the proper alignment of the joints to begin with, right? So if you're, let's say your heels collapse, or sorry, your uh, ankles collapse in, and you're already really collapsed in at the uh, bone, or sorry, at the ankle, then it's going to be really hard for you to get the right position at the hip. Yeah. Because you're going to just going to dump all your energy at the ankle and your hips not going to want to rotate the whole way. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, this foregoes any history of injury or anything like that, but basically have the right structure, which is the bow, um, ankle, he or ankle and hip aligned and ready to pivot at the same time. So one heel or start fourth and fifth metatarsal hitting. There, it rolls in, inside ankle bone high, knee is slightly pointed away because you have the bow, okay? Right. And at the uh, hip and ankle are right on top of each other relatively because when you're moving forward, they might be stacked forward slightly, but they're in line, okay? And that sets you up to pivot both bones, being the femur and the tibia in the same direction and there's your perfect step. So I wanted to, I wanted to quickly, it's, it's, it's going to be hard to hear me because I'm going to be stepping away from my mic, but I wanted to quickly just pull up my camera and I want to show when I, when I started doing this, I was bowing incorrectly. And the reason I was bowing incorrectly was I didn't have enough uh, hip movement as well. And I was initiating from my knee. I was almost like leaning out to try and create a bow and that's, that's, I think, mechanically incorrect. I'm going to show you quickly, and you can break down what I'm doing as I'm doing it. I'm just going to step away from my mic. I'm going to show you the wrong way, and then I'm going to show you the way that I started doing it. So this is the wrong way. Was I don't know if you can still hear me. But I, would, I, would step, I, would, I would step my stance, and then I would push my knee out. And it was, you can almost see, I'm, I'm leaning my hips to the side, but I'm trying to push out, Right. Yeah, so that's this a fun thing to be here right there. Yeah. Right? Now, you want to stick back into your butt. Yeah, so so this is this is the proper so so what I was doing was I was still leaning forward and I was still putting the pressure in the front part. I was leaning my hips to the side to try and bow my leg out. That's not what a bow is. A bow is where you're sitting back into your hips and you're rotating in towards that hip of the front leg. When you do that. The, the, and you keep the foot stable on the outside edge, on the, that pinky toe and that ring toe, your, your knee will naturally bow out. And then when you rotate, it will naturally turn in because you're pivoting on that outside edge of the foot. So those are the two sort of differences. When you're setting a bow, for me, the difference was initiating it from rotating my upper body in towards my hip with that back chain dominant position where you're leaned forward, your ribs are over your hips, and then your whole torso sort of rotates in towards that hip with the foot placement correct, the natural result is a bow. You're not forcing, you're not pushing your knee out. And that's a big difference, you know, you're, you're, you're not trying to make yourself bow-legged <laughs> necessarily intentionally, but when you, tr you, when you have that back chain dominant position and you twist your body towards your hip, and your foot position is correct, then a bow naturally occurs in your leg. That's sort of the structural exactly. effect. So it's not something that you're consciously, you're not like pushing your knees out and you don't have to set the bow by like doing anything weird with your knee. Or you don't have to lean your hip out to the side so that you're stretching out your IT band more. Or you're like trying to extend your hip. You just, you get back chain dominant by having your ribs over your hips. And then you twist in, you twist your whole torso in towards your hip, the hip of the front foot of the stride, and a natural bow will occur if your foot placement is correct. If you have your weight on that outside edge of the foot near the, near the last two, uh, the baby toe and the ring toe, right?
So that's that's my experience. And I just wanted to make that differentiation because I was doing that wrong and it was actually causing me a lot of pain. And if people start doing it incorrectly, they can cause just as much tissue damage as if they're, you know, trying to trying to just like walk heel to toe and in, in the in that straight line model, right? So I wanted to make that quick differentiation. It's something to practice for a long time. You're gonna get a lot out of this movement. So I practice the bow daily, multiple times per day. And once you realize that everything is a bow into another bow. So walking is basically just going from bow to bow to bow. So is running. You're setting bows and releasing them, okay? So it's like you're releasing your energy from side to side and it curves in. So your body rotates the energy from one side, catches it, and then rotates the energy back to the other side and catches it. It's a game of passing energy back and forth and if you're in the right mathematics, being the right joint angles, you're gonna pass that energy back and forth efficiently. And that's where you start to get real efficiency is when you start feeling that. Mm. Yeah, and, and, and that's, you know, ultimately when we're, like that's, that's function is efficiency of force transference from side to side, from, from joint to joint and, and not having, you know, I think the downside of the heel to toe model and that straight lines model is that you just end up absorbing so much more force throughout your joints in ways that your joints are not meant to absorb force, essentially. The, the transference of force between your joints when you get this right makes you feel like a different person. Like you feel lighter. You feel like you're, you're floating. What's the, I'm, I'm going to link this back to what we were saying before with the ankle bones. So back to the ankle bone, you cannot set a great bow without a high ankle bone, okay? Mm. So um, that's why it's so key. People are like, okay, ankle's sweet, but um, I'll load up a squat right now and squat 400, 500, and now I'm powerful. It's like you're going to be leaking a ton of energy if you don't get those ankle bones high, okay? So practicing that alone, going for a walk, keeping your ankle bones high, and that includes when you push your foot back because – that's, I think, an awareness piece that people miss. Okay, I can understand when I land how to keep it high, but not when I'm actually swinging my foot back. Okay, mm -hmm. so ankle bones high, go for a walk, feel this out. So here, here's a question. Say a person or, an, or a prospective athlete is thinking, okay, I get this whole inside ankle bone high thing and I'm going to practice the rotary model and I'm going to start doing this. But I still think that getting a 400 pound back squat is going to make me more powerful. Just imagine how much more powerful I'll be if I'm still also practicing my bows and corners. Yeah. Is there a use for this person from an athletic perspective to still build these heavy back squats? Or are they kind of wasting their time and should they be only practicing these bows and corners and loading those up more? Well, I, I would say the bows and corners thing, I think. Uh, personally, why not load it in a bow? That's what's going to happen the vast majority of time. When you're loading in a traditional bilateral squat, your mechanics are different than when you're running. So why not load it in the pattern of running? The counter argument, of course, is going to be like, because we can load it the most. And then your nervous system will adapt to that, and then it'll automatically transfer into the running. But the right. tissue lengths, right. the type of rotations at the hip that have to happen for running are much more specific than just squatting up and down. Okay, so moving weight forward versus moving it up and down is how I solve that. But that in itself can be a separate podcast. So I don't want to completely answer that. That would be my, uh, you know, general answer at the moment. Cliff notes sort of thing. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's too biomechanically different. And if you're loading super, super heavy in an up and down versus a forward locomotive pattern, you're conditioning your tissues and your nervous system to be effective at moving up and down, not necessarily moving forward. So you can probably get more benefit from tr and less risk from, from moving weight forward in that locomotive pattern in the first place, rather than trying to load and, and kind of get like a carryover effect, so to speak. So rather than carrying over, you're just, just train it directly, <laughs> basically. Uh -huh. Absolutely, and let's definitely do a podcast just on that topic because that would be yeah. We definitely great. will. We definitely will. So, so just to recap, where we're where we're at, we're uh, we're already at forty five minutes in, which always boggles my mind when we're talking. We can get so deep into this so quick. 
we're, we were we were talking about fundamental movement patterns and and essentially what we have so far is a lot of the stuff the, the guys at uh you know the goda system talks about which is you want to keep your inside the inside ankle bone high you want to rotate off of the outside edge of your foot not really onto your toes unless you need balance there's a a bowing of your foot your front foot when you land which happens through a natural rotation towards your hip. And that can only occur if you are back chain dominant. So if you have your ribs over and your shoulders past your hips slightly so that you can be in that forward locomotive energy. Um, once you step forward with the other foot, that front foot starts rotating and internally rotates as you're repeating that same bow on the other side until you feel an efficiency of the, uh, the transference of energy would you say that's like the most fundamental like it, this is walking we're talking we're literally talking about walking the most basic human pattern would you say getting really good at those factors could constitute functional fitness for the most part Ooh, i mean that's that's a loaded question i in order of priority i would say walking is something to master something to do daily something that you can use as a meditative practice. And I'm, I'm feeling different uh, parts of my body every time I walk, run. I prefer to jog and just feel it out. So I'm always doing that as a baseline, okay? And I call it recoding, like GOTA. Um, you're basically coding good movement patterns, feeling different parts of your feet, making sure your ankle bones are high, making sure your body's flowing correctly. Um, I try to feel in terms of efficiency of motion, okay? So my upper body should be in sync with my lower body as I'm walking, okay? That's a higher level of it. But at first, sometimes just getting the cue of having your foot over your, or sorry, your head over your foot as you're walking is where I would start because that's actually where I started. I was never on the uh, head over foot model or building the columns model, mm -hmm. meaning having your head over your foot as you land. I was always in the keep the body straight, which is the brace the core model, which is keeping your uh, spine rigid and making sure that I rotate at the upper body, kind of like this, right? Now it's more like a flow. I'm going back and forth. You can see this in my, uh, you know, roping and uh, yeah. bow staff videos and, and uh, the things I put up on Instagram, but basically making sure that my body moves, the gears are moving in synchronicity. Right. So this isn't yeah. just like a, a, a rotation of the trunk from the upper body. This is a, you're, you're also getting some side bending. So there was a lateral motion of your spine. And if you're, so even if you're on that, that heel to toe model, if you focus on getting your head stacked over your toe on every step, there's a natural spinal movement that happens. And then eventually that rotary pattern is going to almost <laughs> impose itself on you out of necessity, right? But getting that, you would say, Focusing on getting the column stacked first, keeping your center of gravity, basically your head stacked over your foot. That would be the first proverbial step in learning how to step properly. Just imagine this. Try to stand up, lift one foot off the ground. In order to be balanced, your head has to be over your foot. You can't have right. your head between your feet, lift the foot, and be in balance. So basically, you're in balance with every step just because of the mechanical alignment of your head and foot. Okay, I can use this advantageously in many, like in martial arts. If I have my head over my foot, I know I'm balanced. I can press power off that motion. I can also use it as an ability as I'm falling forward. I know that at one point that I'm falling forward, my head is going to be hitting that point where my foot is. That's the point where I can pivot and still land in balance. Okay, so once you get this, you can start playing with it in many different contexts. It's not just walking and running. It's a fundamental principle of balance. You are balanced every time your head is over your foot. This doesn't matter what sport you're in. It doesn't matter where you are. That's the key. And from the previous model, we've been taught to not do that. We've been taught to keep center. So basically, you're falling with every step in the old model of keeping right. your spine nice and straight. Do you want to be falling with every step or do you want to be in balance with every step? Mm. It, it, it's really up to that, right? Um, so that leads really to the spinal engine. 
the fact that your spine has to move from side to side. I know we were going with the, um, you know, the joint model before where we were talking about the ankle and the foot and the knee and the hip, but really yeah. I would say one of the most fundamental, if not the most fundamental pattern is having your spine being able to move side to side, allow it to do that. Okay. Most people don't even allow it to happen because one, you've never been taught to do it and everything is sedentary now. So you lose mm -hmm. that ability over time. Crawling right. pattern. It's a crawling pattern. Okay. So we're, we're talking now about the, like, this is, this is sort of the lateral bending as well as the rotation. This is sort of like, uh, I kind of look like I'm dancing now, <laughs> you know, but um, there's, there's a fluidity and a movement through your spine. You mentioned there's this thing called the brace the core model, which uh, for anyone who hasn't been, totally inundated by any amount of weightlifting coaching. It's you, you squeeze and tense up your core as tight as you can so that your spine stays stable against weight, which if you do have a heavy barbell against your back, like your spine will crumble under that weight unless you brace your core. Um, you will not feel good, <laughs> you know, trying to protect your spine against these heavy weights if you're lifting and you're not bracing your core. However, when it comes to actual functional movement, like moving, walking, running, throwing, uh, these, these basic patterns that we're meant to do, um, even climbing trees or doing anything, there is a rotation of your, and a movement of your spine, a fluidity of your spine that needs to happen in order for us to move properly. So we did start from the ground, but the, the, the challenge behind defining, and we were going joint by joint, right? But the obvious problem we run into when we talk about functional fitness is that we are not, like we're a body, we're not a collection of parts. The, the body is more than the sum of its parts. And when we're talking about human movement, you know, we're talking about the bow, we're talking about cornering, we're, we're kind of breaking down the go to philosophy of, of locomotion, plus talking more about the spinal engine and talking more about the issue is that we run into is that so many joints work in concert with one another. The, the body is a system. The body isn't a collection of parts. That just happen to fit all together and they work in isolation and they create this thing called movement. The body is a system that is designed to work in a particular way and move in concert with itself. So the reason that we're kind of moving away from the isolated joint model, which a lot of people will look at and be like, rotate this joint, move this joint, you know, train this pattern, train the flexion of the elbow, train the extension of whatever. It's it's because we're looking at the way the human body moves in unison with itself, right? Fundamentally. And right now we, you know, we started from the foot and now we're all the way up into the spine and we haven't even touched the shoulders. We haven't touched the neck, but what we're, what we're trying to get at is learn to fucking walk before you run or do anything else. This isn't, this isn't like the metaphor. It's learn to walk. <laughs> Most people don't know they need to do that. And it's really a symphony of joints in your body. That's why it can't be isolated. That's why it can't be so clean where I can be like, this does this, this does this, this does this you know, like just going up the chain, which is the traditional way to do it. I'm trying, but you know, I get sidetracked because there's so much to it. Um, but in the end, it simplifies it. Okay. <laughs> because it's actually been complicated by going isolated part by isolated part. It's less complicated in the whole, but it's a different paradigm. Okay. Yeah. Your body works as a, a symphony of different parts they're working in harmony. If one's not working, it'll change the way another one works, okay? Now, I don't mind this being an ongoing series because it is yeah, that complicated, yeah. and this is the way I would want to do it. Um, I wouldn't want to just be like, okay, one part does this, the other part does this. The yeah, farthest yeah. that the old model goes is, um, and I can tell you because I've learned it this way, is, okay, the foot is a, a mobile structure, or sorry, the ankle's a mobile structure, the knee's a stable structure, the hip is a mobile structure, the low back is a stable structure, mid back is a mobile structure, and then it goes, you know, it flips from one to the other. That's about as complicated as it gets without going into specific joint mechanics, because that's where traditional physio knows and, and biomechanics, they know what happens inside the joint. They're just missing the bigger picture because they don't look at slow motion. Okay, right. so, yeah. So they're, they're looking, they're looking more at the mechanics of the individual joints. They're looking at the, the physical structures 
but they're not looking at the way those physical structures actually move and they're not analyzing the actual video of the way human beings are moving and the way that our bodies transfer force and they're not looking at that from a practical standpoint maybe maybe a practical standpoint if you're cutting us open <laughs> you know they're they're understanding the the physiology and the the, the the well again the biomechanics of individual joints but you're saying that to really understand movement you have to actually look at human movement and the best way to look at human movement is to take a video in slow motion and break it down as much as you can yes and and science does do that like um there's a lot of value they put you know the cameras on the body where they have you know the points the dots i think it's used in in films and animation um where they can see different parts of the body move that does happen mm. however in real time i can take my phone and go through 20 different injuries or 20 different plays on youtube and i can see the commonalities it's just moving the information is moving so much faster and it's in a bigger context if you look at thousands of injuries or thousands of uh different types of mechanics and boil it down to and distill it into particular movements a checklist of important steps that happen during a movement okay so that's really where it's it's different now we don't need uh papers to uh grab my phone and watch a hundred different videos on movement okay no. so the information is flowing fast yeah so 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 we have we have more data we have more visible you know, like visible things that we can look at because we have access to tons of tons and tons of film online, for example. Like I, I literally, I went and YouTube slow motion sprinter today and I found tons of video on YouTube and I could just break that down and I can look at these mechanics and I can be like, wow, this, this fast sprinter that never injured himself is, is, is doing these things. I can start to mimic them and I can really break it down. Um, and because the information is out there, we're able to sort of even gather more information than uh, academics who might be slowed down by a more formal process. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, it really comes down to this. Guys that are watching film as a passion are going, look, we're seeing this happen over and over and over again. Can we acknowledge this or at least talk about it? And that's kind of yeah. where we're coming in right now, right? I'm bringing up these topics that aren't really debated. You rarely see any debate in this field because people don't want to cross paths with, it, it's just not a field that there's debates in, right? No. So I'm bringing yeah. up the points that of contention in the deepest layers of the movement community, basically, right? Where science doesn't meet, doesn't hit the rubber, doesn't hit the road, basically, right? Yeah. In practical, application we're seeing this your papers are saying this let's hash this out what are we seeing here mm. okay so at least we can that get those discussions going right so, so the discussion that we're having today um you know we set out to sort of break down well what are the fundamental movement patterns that constitute fun functional fitness and it's really interesting because i find conversations like this will start with one intention but because the 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 thing that the thing that we're talking about is so deep or so complex it's not as simple as just answering the question be like oh well you know it's just like patterns are you know walk and practice your walk by doing this move like it's there's there's so much more depth to to everything like you're talking about now like <laughs> looking at slow motion video versus looking at just scientific studies, right? It's not as simple as like, okay, well, you know, you want to train your chest, you do a bench press, you want to train your legs, you do a squat. It's like, what are the, what are the foundational movements of, of, of functional fitness? Well, how can you, what are the patterns that make you most efficient at, at the things that you do every day? That's, that's ultimately, that's the answer to the question. You can, you can determine that by watching you know tons of video of, of the people who are the best in the world at what they do athletes who are the best movers in the world and you can break down their patterns but you, you don't have to do that because a lot of other people are doing that right now and there are discussions about it and that's what you know that's why companies like goda for example are, are kind of getting into it um i think you know now Aguilar at functional patterns is doing some kind of cool stuff but he i you know it's funny 
because after studying a lot of the Gota stuff and watching a lot of slow mo, seeing a lot of Naudi's patterning with the lower body and not respecting this sort of rotary system of the hips and the knees and the ankles, like he he like I wouldn't trust Naudi to train my lower body at all. You know, like it's it's one of these things where it's like he's not he's not patterning good habits with the rotary system. He might be able to free up a person's hips. He might be able to create even a back chain dominance in, in some of his stuff, but he, he'll miss that fundamental, that rotary pattern of the foot, right? So would, this is- this is what he has to say about it, right? Mm. Well, I would love to hear, like, that's why these discussions are happening, right? Because he is, what you're speaking of is on Instagram, a lot of the go-to guys uh, will uh, feature Naudi doing things that are woda, meaning that basically he's duck footed on some of his maneuvers that, you know, some people would say that that's not the right way to move and uh, they're calling him out on it, right? So because I think these are fundamental principles, I would love to hear what he has to say about it. Highly doubt there's going to be a debate there, but it would be great to hear. That's one of those uh, industry debates that should happen. What is actually happening at the ankle and at the foot as you move? Here's the slow motion, hundreds of slow motion replays that we're watching. Maybe you have a theory. Maybe uh, one could elaborate on this, right? But if you don't actually address the questions, then they can't be answered. Mm -hmm. um, like heel away, like keeping your ankle bone high, like watching slow motion of the same injuries happening in the same way. For instance, Achilles injuries happening off the inside edge of the foot. Yeah. meniscus injuries yeah. happening off the inside edge of the foot i'm watching enough tape to know that this is something there's something to this okay i can't just ignore this at this no, point because no. now i've watched this happen a hundred times and i haven't seen many counter examples if any okay so maybe still shots that don't put context in in uh, the picture but i'm seeing patterns in slow motion that aren't explained by science and uh need to be addressed that way or should be addressed mm -hmm. yeah and, and and basically what what it is is it's seeing something that everyone else has missed the entire time right because maybe they're working off again a framework or a map or a model that is based on looking at everything in isolation looking at the the physiology of it looking at the tissues and the the structures and making their best guess at what at what these structures are supposed to do based on the way these structures are put together, not necessarily looking at the, the monumental amounts of visual data that you get from, like you said, watching hundreds of hours of film and breaking down, what, like watching people tear their ACL and seeing the exact same inside ankle bone collapse over and over and over again, being able to determine that like, okay, you see this pattern, they're not gonna last five years in the NFL. They're going to be busted out with a, with some sort of major injury. And, you know, ultimately the reason that we're having these conversations is because a, they're not being had enough because everyone's just, just sort of assuming an old model is correct. There's, there's so much, uh, I'm going to call it dogma around barbell training and around, you know, any, any basic fit, traditional conventional strength training there's so much dogma around it and it's very precious to people. And I was one of those people for a very long time. I loved the barbell. I formed my personality around it as a personal trainer because I loved lifting weights. I loved being strong. I loved having big muscles, but uh, you know, I was injured every two or three months, like literally every two or three months. And for me, it was, uh, you know, you, your ego can only take so much before it has to crack and you have to realize maybe what you're doing is fucking wrong. Maybe you're operating on the wrong paradigm here. And that's what happened to me. That's why that's why Will and I have been talking more about this stuff. And that's why we even decided to start this podcast was because we need to talk about this. Like, I know, Will, you actually used to own one of the CrossFit gyms in Banff and moved away from CrossFit entirely. And not just, you know, like you stepped away from that. What Probably, if I had to guess, you know, we haven't talked about this. My guess is that you just started diving more into the stuff and realizing there was like deeper truth to movement and, and it wasn't through a barbell. Yeah, it's, it was basically that. I think we could do a whole, uh, you know, podcast on why I did it um, because it's very interesting, but it's, it's basically, I had more knowledge about movement 
and I was moving paradigms, right? So I felt like I was closed in by just lifting weights and having that model of always like, let's say I get a deadlift that's 400 pounds. It's like, push it to 450. It's like, okay, then I get injured. It goes back again. And I'm like, I know better than this, you know? And uh, you don't necessarily have to do CrossFit that way, right? So as a, as a model, I don't want to shit on CrossFit because I think it's really good, right? Like, I think it elevates people in a major way, right? Mm -hmm. But I just knew that there was more to it. Why not look at the joints specifically? And that's where FRC and functional patterns came in. They did kind of like put me in that paradigm. So I'm glad for that. But... At the time, I was just lifting weights, just doing exercises for performance, not for skills. To learn skills for the future, to know what's going to make me healthy and powerful, yet uh, very efficient, okay? That was not uh, what I was getting at CrossFit or doing at CrossFit. I knew there was yeah. more to it, and that's where I kind of went on a journey of a few years of just daily practice of movement and figuring things that worked and didn't work. And I would do it daily during my lunches, two, three hours a day, just working on movement. And that's where I am right now. And that's how, why I know through trial and error, I'm like, there's something to this uh, go to paradigm that is just going to explode. It's going to be, because it's true. A lot of it is true. Okay. So you can't ignore it at this point. And there's a lot of other systems that bring in great, uh, information and that I've uh, used their information to compile functional patterns, WAC method, of course, great stuff. But as a system, a new paradigm, a new way of looking at the body, I think go to is number one. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's why, again, guys, like we, we broke down a lot of go to principles in our, in our talk today. The, the intention was really, again, to break down what are what are the basics that you should be working on if you want to be good at at functional fitness if you want to have a a, base, a strong base of functional fitness it's 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 working out your gait right and and Goda seems to have found the truth in terms of how the gait works best that force transference that efficient transference of energy that protects your connective tissue just to recap again because we, we we covered it and there's still more to cover by the way we we just we kind of got we we, we do tangents because that's what we do. It's a podcast. We're here to talk about the it. Tangents with me because that's that's what happens. But it'll be interesting. I promise. <laughs> no, it's and and you know what? Like I, I'm, I'm always interested in this stuff, and I hope the people who are listening are too because the, the depth that this goes into. If you're like me, you might have listened to this podcast once and been like, ah, I don't really get it. But then years later, you're gonna come back and you'll be like, Oh my god, these guys were talking about it the whole time. I went through that with uh, with the Goda guys. Even I remember the first time I saw them. I'm like, fuck are these guys talking about and then i came back years later and i was like oh my god i'm like full hook line and sinker so to recap guys you know we're, we're, we started with the foot so even if you want to like what will said was if you want to start practicing you want to start messing with your gait a little bit start by practicing getting your head directly stacked over your foot on every step and that'll naturally encourage a bit of a sway back and forth, a bit of a side bend and a twist in your spine um, to start working the spinal engine. Is that right? That's like a, a good first step for people? Yeah, absolutely. Land on the outside edge of your foot. Be nice and quiet with your feet. Um, try to have your head landing over your foot, swaying back and forth, allowing your spine the freedom to move and uh, keep your ankle bones high. If you haven't worked on this before, those three things will bring you a lot of fruit in itself. Also, a lot of fourth, stay back chain dominant, have your ribs leaning a little bit far forward with a tall spine. Yeah, and, and basically, you can, you can do that just by going on walks and being conscious of your walking. Like for me, a lot of my training, quote unquote, is either patterning in those, those bows or, or just going on long walks and being hyper hyper aware of the mechanics that I'm doing. Are my heels bending out when I step back as a natural result of that pivot point? Like how good is my pivot point? And I'll focus on different things through different parts of my walk. Some days I'll focus on getting my head stacked directly over my foot. Other days I'll focus on making sure that I'm sitting into my hip when I'm twisting into that front step with that back chain dominance. 
Other days, I'll focus on that pivot point. Other days, I'll focus on just staying relaxed and breathing and not getting too, too, too worried about the mechanics and just seeing what happens when I don't pay attention to it. You know, because that's part of it too. It's like, what are your natural, what are your natural tendencies? Do you even know what you're doing when you're walking? Do you know how your body naturally wants to walk versus, you know, how, how good that, those are good. Cause if you're, if you're quote recoding, if you're trying to code this, this um, biomechanical pattern, if you don't think about it, what happens? Right. Uh, you have to think about it at first. It's, it's very much awareness and behavior in order to change mm -hmm. behavior. You have to become aware of where you're, misbehaving the misbehaviors in the movement right so you have to just really bring it into awareness for a bit some people can do it right away some people takes years some people depending on your history you know if i have a structure let's say my ankle and i broke my ankle before or twisted it or dislocated it uh recoding your ankle or getting your ankle strong again and integrated with your body is going to take a little bit more practice right but you can always improve and go in the positive direction Okay, that's what yeah. you're looking to do. Your behaviors being more positive, your movement behaviors, um, the next day versus negative. Um, Want to go back to uh, maybe the knee where we're at right now? And yeah, yeah. So we, you know, we talked we talked about the foot, we talked about the hip a little bit, and talked about back chain dominance, talked about the sway in the hip. Um, but the knee is actually really important too, because like I said, it's very easy to overthink the bow and, and like kind of jack, make your knee really janky. So, so let's talk about the knee a little bit. Yeah. So, um, the knee is in alignment in my mind when you're in a bow. Okay. Let's do the opposite of a bow where the foot is really, um, you know, uh, what's it called? Um, uh, in valgus. Okay, so basically your knees are knock kneed. Okay, we'll talk about that. When that happens, there's a lot of pressure on the inside of your knee. You know that if you're extremely knock kneed and someone would hit you from the side, you're compromised. You can feel that. Okay, um, your ACL is in that easily torn position. Your Achilles is in that easily torn position just because mechanically they're not stacked on top of each other. Okay, Anthony, mm -hmm. while I'm talking, can you pull up some uh, some knock knees just like on a yeah. Google image? So basically, um, you're dumping in the energy towards the middle. So if someone gives you a little bit of extra energy towards the same direction, you're going to injure a tissue that's designed to stop that energy. Okay, so I mean, intuitively, you can look at the knock knees and see that it's going to be a problem. Okay. Knock knees will almost always come with low ankle bones, okay? And given that it's not a, um, you know, a birth, something happened to the bones at birth, okay? We're talking mm -hmm. about most normal people. Some people can have exceptions, right? But basically, that's what I was talking about. The ankle bones will likely be collapsed or much more easily collapsed. And this is a huge issue for repetitive injury, okay? A lot of people are not naturally knock need, but they're weak and they found that position as a default in their nervous system. Okay. And this can mm. be easily trained out of somebody in this situation. So something like go to training or training each part to understand where it needs to be in this picture right here, for example, can you pull that back up? Okay. So in this picture, for example, <laughs> I probably have them, although this may be deceiving because uh, she's in the middle of a stride. This may actually be a decent stride, but let's pretend this is actually knock knee, okay? Um, I would take that knee and make her understand how to pivot it out. So I'm talking about the right one if it's facing towards you. I would teach her how to pivot it out and then back in, how to be aware of what each feels like. And then as it's out, that's the actual bow. So I would teach her the bow position and make sure she understands it because some people just don't understand positions. That's the first place to go to when you're training. It's basically. But I mean, even if you under... look, even if you look at the foot on the right here, the back foot, like you can even see if you were to draw a line through it, her inside ankle bone is low, right? You're like, oh, it might be deceiving because like, look at her knee, look at, look at her, the position of her ankles in relationship to her knees. And then the pressure, you can even think it's like the pressure is going to start 
at that inside ankle bone low position, the column goes straight up into the inside of her knee, and that's going to jack her up really, really bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, um, she's not in alignment. She's not creating a bow in this position, and uh, she's going to be dumping energy into her connective tissue unnecessarily, okay? Mm. So with every step, if you're not in a bow, if you're not landing in a bow and your foot's not supinated up, if it's not uh, landing on the outside edge of the foot, you're going to be dumping energy into either your ankle, your knee, or your hip, probably all the above. Hmm. Okay. So with the knee, uh, I don't need this, this picture so much anymore. Oh, can you go to that one, uh, above shows a runner that's knocking it's a, this top one? right right now. This yes. This one. Okay. Oh, yeah, exactly. So this picture is a good, um, a good example of inside ankle bone low. So you can see that it's his ankle is dumped energy. His knee is pointed in. Okay. So like that is not a good bow structure. He could bow that out another, um, his knee should be pointing way out there. Can you put the cursor to the, yeah, right there. So basically his knee should be further out towards the, um, where his foot is he's all messed up basically right from the ankle he's leaking too much look, look, look you can even see the curvature of his ankle like you can see the force is coming down into that inside part of his foot here right yeah and the, so and the result sorry go ahead no, no i was i was just saying it's like you can you can see why his knee starts to spiral in like this because his weight is transferring here that as soon as that ankle bone starts pivoting down and the force transference comes down, the knee naturally swivels in and that's where you get that pressure. You can actually even see where that pressure is happening as, as, as they land on that stride. He's, he has to, because his ankle isn't in the correct motion, it's not high, the inside of the ankle bone, he has to dump his knee in. The pressure is going to go on towards the inside tissues as it's spinning towards the inside. And his hip is going to have to internally rotate. So he's dumping energy into internal rotation with every step because his ankles are weak, possibly his foot. It's a still image, so it's really hard to tell exactly what's going on. But you can tell from this image this person's going to have an issue. Okay? Um, so, yeah. Uh, basically, the knee goes is in the middle of the ankle and the hip. And in order to have the knee in the proper spot in that bow position, you have to have the ankle and the hip in alignment. If it's not, it's not going to work. Okay, you can see the ankle or the hip is above the ankle in the, uh, can you go to the last picture again? In this photo, the hip is way out. So she's pushed her hip out. Imagine bumping someone next to you. That's what she's doing there with her right hip as she lands. And her ankle is way to the inside, right? So basically, those two points, the ankle and the hip are not in alignment and she's dumping energy out of her hip on this one her ankle bone does stay high which is nice but she's just dumped way too much out of her hip and for this person i would work more specifically on the hip okay because that seems to be this person's particular issue you, you, you can see it high, right like you, yeah yeah it's like you can again if you drew if you drew a line from her hip like that's not from a rotation that is just literally her hip is hiking way up on one side yeah, this could be an awareness piece. She could just be unaware that she's doing that and with a little bit of cueing, a little bit of you're supposed to land like this or feel what it's like to land like this instead of this. Some people get that right away. Other people are actually physically weak in that area and need to be trained a little more specifically, kind of like FRC style. But mm -hmm. either way, you could get that person to understand the bow and get them in the bow position right away. Mm, and get them working exactly. towards that perfect landing position within the first second, no matter who it is. Yeah. Unless they've had a major injury. Totally, totally. And I, I, well, here, here, this is a, this is a perfect oh, picture, I think. Yeah, that's a great. It's a perfect right picture of a bow, right? Like you can see yeah. right now the the inside ankle bone because of where her pressure is on the outside edge of her foot, it shoots way up. So again, when Will's talking about, imagine drawing a line between your two ankles. Is the ankle bone on the outside lower than that high inside ankle bone? If it is, then the pressure is naturally going to scoop out, 
and your knee is naturally going to turn out and to, to and meet your bow, right? Yes. So, you, so right there, the knee is pointing out. Okay, it's pointing outwards, and so is her torso. So if you look at her torso and her knee, if I was to uh, put a dot right at her um, sternum, she would be, or sorry, her uh, xiphoid process in the middle there, right above the nine. She's pointed out in the exact direction of her knee. That's how I want to land, and that's how I want to uh, land in that bow. And right now, her IT band's taking the load, and it's about to snap back in the other direction by spinning both the femur and the tibia internally. And that's going to send the energy for her to create a bow on the other side. Repeat the process. Mm. So she, she basically, she's not just using, like, even though she has very well-developed quads and everything, it's not just her muscles that, that are, like, propelling her forward. She has an efficient transference of energy. And this is the thing. It's like, you can have all the power in the world, but if you're not transferring your energy efficiently, your joints are going to start to wear out and you're going to get burnt out way faster because you're using so much more juice to propel yourself forward instead of allowing the natural momentum, that natural flow of energy to, to arc. So again, like that, that point about the xiphoid process pointing in the same direction as the knee, like when you're, when you're taking a step forward, try to rotate your, your body, your chest towards that front leg while, while maintaining that pressure on the outside edge of your foot, keeping that inside ankle bone high. Watch what happens. The bow naturally sets itself. There's a natural bow. Again, this isn't something that like, you don't have to push your knee out to the side. You don't have to like force your knee to rotate. Just turn, stay back chain dominant. Keep, keep your foot position correct and turn your body towards your knee and the bow will naturally set. There's a tutorial on Instagram that I'll link in the description for you to try yeah. the bow, okay? Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it'll be great stuff. Yeah, so, this so is, this the, is knee, awesome. the knee when you're landing is pointing outwards, not straight ahead, okay? Like ideally in my mind. Yeah. Let's see Michael Jordan there. Yeah, this is, this is like a, that's a painting of Michael Jordan. Yeah, yeah. But we sure. got, Somebody did it accurate. Or, I mean, all those look pretty good, yeah. Well, these, this, is, this is all, uh, I literally Googled go to bow. So oh, okay, so we can some, some some goats with bows <laughs> but i like this this is this is like one of the best oh, yeah that's beautiful like, like look at that look at that that's that's inside angle bone high he's reaching for the outside edge of his foot it bows out naturally and his whole weight transference is going to rotate out you can even like you can't really tell from from because you can't see his his foot but when he rotates out that other that back heel is going to come way out and you it's funny because you can look look you can look at the guy in the background his inside ankle bone is low and then you see his knee knocking in slightly versus like this guy inside ankle bone high knees not really knocking in you kind of have a bit of a bow going on right this one's obviously the most dramatic but this one you can, you can even you can draw the line between the two ankle bones and you see the knee kind of comes in before it comes back out to the hip. Yeah, so in this picture of this guy with the ball, he's obviously, this guy's a specimen. That is a beautiful bow. You know, this is what you'll see from a serious athlete. Um, you can see how far his hip is sunk in. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah. it is way back. He's in the back chain. His upper body's leaning forward. His torso and his knee are pointed in the same direction. That's how you know it's a good bow. And his foot is supinated up. It's, it, his ankle bone is way up top. He's going to get a ton of energy off that and be able to release it to the other side. That's exactly what you want there um, to, a very, to various degrees. This is obviously what it looks like when you're cutting and running super fast. Not every bow is going to be as dramatic if you're walking, no. right? But no, it's no, definitely no. not caving in. You're doing the principles again, keeping your uh, weight on the outside edge of your foot, inside ankle bone high, knee pointed in the same direction as the torso. There you go. And I think that was, you know, that, that was the point here too that I wanted to say, we're, since we're talking about the knee, it's like, where's the knee? Well, the knee is pointing in the exact same direction as the torso, no matter what. So if your spine naturally twists and moves, then and you and your front leg is set properly, you're on the outside edge of your foot, 
your inside ankle bone is high. If you turn your torso, your knee should follow the direction of where your torso is. That's, that's basic. That's what your knee should be doing. In terms of proper knee biomechanics, like set your knee to where your torso is, and then you're, you're pretty much golden. Like, again, I want to pull up that picture, that first one that I had here, where and it's, there it's is like a little two. Play. There is a little bit of play because let's say you're not running in a straight line. You're not, your torso, if you're cutting on somebody or something like that, your torso may go off kilter or your knee or something like that because there's a little bit of play but for the most part if you're running straight your knee and your torso are matching angles hmm. to a to a very close degree so this is this is walking this is running this is crawling this is uh this is human biomechanics and these are universal principles right this is the the, the thing that like when we're talking about what are the fundamentals of, of functional fitness like we're i guess the 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 issue the thing that i've kind of come to through talking through having this conversation is like the, the foundation of functional fitness is not joints not even necessarily movement patterns it's what are universals within human biomechanics what i'm seeing is like the bow in the corner the the sort of the pivotal system like these are universal principles whether you're walking crawling running uh doing any of this stuff those are universals right so this is we could talk about you know universal principle number one bow and corner from the from the go to perspective from from the perspective of walking and running so if you want to start if you want to start moving better you want to start feeling better in your body we're going to link uh will's instagram and will's youtube stuff he has some very very good info some very awesome visual instructional stuff on how to start working on the basics of this um Obviously, Goda, which we mentioned a lot, um, Coach Bam, Coach Gill, Coach Ricky, Coach Gary at GLS, like all these guys who invented the system, they're they're indispensable as well, and they have tons of free content on their Instagram and their YouTubes as well. But if you wanted to start, if you wanted to like start playing with these universal principles of functional fitness, of of like real good efficient force transfers from step to step, start walking on those outside edges of the feet start creating those bows get in your back chain get really really involved in how you step and how you transfer force from foot to foot and make it more and more efficient over time that is your starting point and i can't even begin to tell you i've been doing this only for a couple of months now maybe since august at the latest it's october now and my my body the way my body feels and works and operates is massive my partner noticed that i'm more agile just living my life and that my movement is more fluid i feel less pain in every joint in my body and and this is something that anyone can start applying so will just to, just to kind of wrap up you know like what do you say like for for you that that that's the biggest takeaway for me biggest takeaway that you want people to kind of walk away with while we're talking about this what's the biggest go home with moment for you yeah um the, there's a lot of info here but we can distill it down into the checklist that we went through it's basically land on the outside of your foot head over foot try to have your heel come away from your body so point it out as you step, okay? That one's a little bit more complicated. Inside ankle bone high. A good bow set, which I'll link on Instagram. Take a look, okay? And head over your foot. Head over foot, inside ankle bone high, land on the outside of your foot, and create a nice bow. Stay back chain dominant, but below and behind your rib cage, even when you're resting. And so guys, replay that. What he just said, go rewind, replay that over and over, write it out of the checklist. I'll write it out as a checklist in the uh, in the description even. But start with that. Go check out the links that we included. If you're listening on Spotify or iTunes or whatever, we're, we're going to have it linked in there. If you're listening on No Filter, then we just go to Will's, the at the Art of Move Instagram to check him out. And you can find all the other links that he has on there as well. Um, this was episode two of the Art of Move podcast. We're going to do as many of these as our schedule allows for, because we love talking about this. There's so much that we want to get into. We're going to start having guests on here. Um, found out recently that the actual go-to guys are going to be starting on No Filter themselves. 
So we're going to try and get them on and, and get some input from the people who started and how they figured all this stuff out. Um, but these are these are the fundamentals, guys. Like once you once you get into the basics, once you learn how to walk, then you can do just about everything else. And I'm not joking. It seems really, um, it seemed really ridiculous to me to focus so much on just walking. But once you understand the principles behind it, the pivotal system. Um, you know, Will took me out and we did some rope work and we were getting into the flow. And then I'm swinging a kettlebell in a different way. And I'm like, I'm playing with different movement patterns and weighting things differently. And my body feels amazing. And I mean, like, better than it's felt doing yoga, doing, you know, complicated stretch routines, doing functional range conditioning, doing any system that I've ever worked. Um, just start working on the fundamentals. The universal principles of human movement, guys, are where it's at. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, this is obviously going to be going ongoing because we only really, you know, got foot, ankle, a little bit of knee, a little bit of hip, went on a lot of tangents. We'll continue that. Talk about spinal engine. Um, any questions, please throw them down. Um, love to hear it because this is complicated stuff, might be paradigm changing. There's going to be a lot of clarity that needs to happen. Love to hear questions, debates, open to it. And yeah, can't wait to do the next episode. Yeah, man. And I think our next episode is going to be this Thursday at 2.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. That's 1.30 if you're on the West Coast in California. That is going to be uh, 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's the only time zone I'm doing. I'm not going to sit here and give you every. But 2.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Dare to Move podcast live on nofilter.net. We'll see you then, October 14th. Thanks, Will. All right. Peace out.